Welcome to the Cross Canada Spotlight. I'm Mike Arsenault. Every week we take a look at a handful of the most interesting and entertaining stories produced across the Global News Network. Our first story this week takes us to New Brunswick, where two long-lost sisters found each other after five decades apart, and a Global News camera was there to capture the reunion. Micheline Gerard routinely works away at her booth at the Bucktouche Market like she has for the past 18 years, unaware that this was about to be no typical day. I am about ready to die. <laughs> While Michelin tends to customers, only a few booths away, hidden in a back boardroom, is her long-lost half-sister, chomping at the bit to meet her. <laughs> I'm so excited to meet her and I just couldn't wait. The two sisters found each other online earlier this month, after Michelin did a DNA test and eventually discovered that the two share a mother. I haven't stopped shaking ever since. <laughs> Sue says she found out about her half-sister about eight years ago, but was unable to find her. She just looks exactly like my mother. She's got fac facial features that just nail it. The two connected on social media and instantly bonded. We've already established some kind of sister bond. But living nearly an hour apart, they had only chatted and cried together online. Every time she cries, she opens up a new box. So. I brought her two today. Michelin's market family found out about the reunion, so naturally they wanted in on planning out a surprise meeting. We just want to be part of the moment and make it extra special for the sisters reuniting. Needless to say, those boxes of tissues came in handy. <laughs> Thanks to a random DNA test and a little social media digging. In 36 hours, I had discovered who my sister was. You look like mom when she was younger. Oh, oh my sister. God. Very excited, surprised. Now the newfound siblings are making plans to take a trip together and catch up on nearly five decades apart. Like I found a piece of home, something was missing the whole time and it's her, 100%. Shelly Steves, Global News, Bucktouche. What a happy ending for Sue and Micheline. I'm sure there are some bittersweet feelings for both of them. It's awesome that they found each other and that vacation together can help them make up for some lost time, but it's too bad they had that lost time to make up in the first place. To the West Coast now, where a massive litter of puppies could have led to fines and tickets for one dog owner, but instead Animal Control stepped in to help the pups in need. Okay. 14 puppies are a whole lot of cute, work, fun, and a little bit of trouble. Add being evacuated from your home due to wildfires, and you might just find yourself in a tricky situation. But it is noisy, you know, first thing in the morning, you know, when they are all hungry, they're yipping. Mm -hmm. All 14, so just imagine. <laughs> After being evacuated from his home three weeks ago with a large litter of puppies, Alex's friend offered him, the puppies, and their dog mom, Roxanne, a place to stay. But the neighbors weren't too happy with the addition to the street. That's when Animal Control stepped in to help. Well, on August 23rd, I believe we had a f quite a few calls coming from the household. And our original plan was to go there and give tickets. Um, however, when we talked to Alex and kind of found out that he was an evacuee and we found out his situation, we said, OK, well, we can get creative with this. And so we took them all to the shelter and we brought all 14 puppies here free of charge. That meant Ashley, who is a dog lover, could spend some quality time with the pack while Alex could take some much needed rest after months of providing around the clock care to the dogs and catch up on his studying to become a veterinarian. It relieved me and I was able to work on more of my schooling and just catch up on pretty much everything. I was able to go to Vancouver and go to a funeral. It just helped me out a lot with my everything, pretty much, my well-being. But now they're reunited for a short while. Half the litter will be going to their new homes within two weeks, and the other half are still in need of a good family and are able to be adopted. For more information about adoption, visit our website, globalnews.ca slash Okanagan. Sydney Morton, Global News, Vernon. I think the moral of that story is a little understanding goes a long way. It could have ended differently if not for the compassion of animal control. It's amazing that seven of the puppies have been adopted, and hey, if you're watching from the Lower Mainland in BC, maybe you're interested in a new addition to your family. From BC to Kingston, Ontario, and the Royal Military College, a profile on a program for Indigenous cadets looking to hone and gain some new skills. 
They've been here at Kingston's Royal Military College for just over three weeks now. These students are a part of the Aboriginal Leadership Opportunity Year, also known as ALOI. I was a little bit skeptical. I didn't know if I should apply to university or take on this opportunity. And uh, it took some courage, but I decided to come here and I'm really enjoying my time so far. I just wanted a new experience and I knew that I wanted to become a military officer, hopefully. And it was just a perfect fit. Just two of this year's 18 Alloy students, all taking part in this badging ceremony. Thank you, sir. Good day. Yeah. The one-year program started back in 2008, and it focuses on academic education, military skills, athletics, and cultural awareness. Alloy is an opportunity for Indigenous students to learn to become students, to decide if they do have a, a taste for military life, uh, they certainly have the option to study here at the college, anywhere else. Sometimes they decide they don't like the idea of academics as part of their life, so they'll move on to something else. And while a career in the military may not be for everyone in this class, all will be able to walk away from the program better prepared for their futures. What I'm really passionate about is learning kinesiology. I really want to go to university to have a bachelor's of kinesiology, and I'm thinking the military may be able to pay my way. Um, so that is a good possibility that I am looking into. If not, uh, I'm thinking of a civilian university. It just opens another door in my life that hadn't been opened before, and I will most likely go through that door to becoming a forensic pathologist in the Canadian Armed Forces in the mil uh, as an officer. Mike Postovit, Global News, Kingston. I went to Queen's University for my undergraduate degree, so I was very familiar with RMC during my time there as our campuses were very close together. But I had never heard of the Alloy program before. It seems like a good initiative to give Indigenous students some additional career options and skills that will definitely last a lifetime. Back to New Brunswick now for a story on a swimmer who brought home gold in the Paralympics. She dove in with the goal of bringing home gold and did not disappoint. I'm still trying to process this whole event. Um, it's been mind blowing and I'm very proud. New Brunswick's Danielle Doris made a big splash at the Paralympic Games in Tokyo on Friday, winning the women's 50 meter butterfly S7 in world record time. She also posted the fastest time ever for a female athlete in her class and heat. I saw the time. I was honestly very shocked. I was not prepared uh, to go under 33. Back home watching from their home in Moncton, her father says he knew from the moment she hit the water that his daughter was on track for gold. It was just nuts. It was just unbelievable to watch her go. With fellow New Brunswicker and her Canadian Paralympic swim coach, Ryan Allen, cheering her on, like he has for the past seven years. Being here gave her a really big boost. It was a comfort boost, especially where knowing that family couldn't be here. Having him there gave me that sense of normality. Um, so having him there was just very um, fun and special. And so was this moment when Danielle secretly arranged for Ryan to place her gold medal around her neck, a rare honor at the games. After my swim, I was like, you're gonna come put my medal on me. And he started tearing up. <laughs> I honestly had to turn around and look the other way because it was hit with emotion. A teary-eyed golden moment seven years in the making. Doris arrives back home in New Brunswick overnight Sunday with both a gold and a silver medal in hand, no doubt to a few more tears. Anticipating my mother crying and my dad being beside her. Bet you're going to give her a big hug. Oh, we are going to give her a one hell of a big hug. <laughs> Shetley Steves, Global News, Moncton. Congratulations to Danielle, but it also makes me a little bit sad for all of the Paralympic and Olympic athletes who competed in Tokyo, but were unable to have their family there watching in person. I hope many of them get another chance to compete in Paris in 2024 in front of packed stadiums. Now our last story will tug on your heartstrings. It's about a man named Ken who needs your help. Ken Hildebrandt has defied the odds of survival more than once. As an infant, he was diagnosed with polio, receiving experimental surgeries and spending much of his childhood in hospital. 
When I was in the children's hospital, I, de I learned to deal with depression. I learned to deal with uh, opiate addictions. He was told he would never walk, but pushed against that advice, going on to work as a paramedic, pursue his passion for wildlife sustainability, and raise a family. But in January 2008, the unthinkable happened when his quad rolled over, trapping him underneath and leaving him out in the cold Alberta wilderness all alone. I used to teach wilderness first aid and survival. And because I worked on an ambulance and everything, I knew all the signs and symptoms of what was happening with my body. For three whole days, he stayed awake, fighting for his life. So I knew if I would have went to sleep, I would have died of hypothermia. Ken's left leg severely weakened by polio, his right leg amputated from the accident. The prosthetic he wears is now past its lifespan, hindering his mobility and worrying his family. Everybody's worried about it. We see him falling all the time. It really is just a matter of time before he breaks something. Ken's daughter, Lori Chronic, and close friend Deborah Hinter started a GoFundMe page to help raise money for a new leg. The cost, just shy of $80,000 after health coverage. He needs this leg, and I believe in 100% that this is going to make a big difference in his life. This GoFundMe has really humbled me. I have never asked for anything. But there are good people out there. As his journey through life continues, Ken's message is simple. Every time when you wake up in the morning, you have a choice. You can make it a good day or a bad day. No matter what happens in that day, you can always find something good. Eloise Terrien, Global News. I just checked out Ken's GoFundMe page and it has now raised over $11,000. That's fantastic, but it still has a long way to go before the goal of $80,000. Hopefully some of you watching may be able to help Ken out. Now that's it for the Cross Canada Spotlight this week. Be sure to watch Global News Weekend Saturday and Sunday mornings at 7 a.m. on the Global TV app.